Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and thank you for that introduction. I moved to Sweden in 2003. Um, and when I came here, there was no news in English. It takes time for people to learn a new language, of course, especially if you come from an English-speaking country and you come here and everybody speaks English to you. But one of the things that struck me when I came here and when I, when I started living here and wanted to connect with the society around me was how excluded I felt and how vulnerable I felt through not being able to understand the news. And I realized that for all of my life, I'd taken news for granted, I'd taken it as something to to read on the train on the, way to, on the way to work, or something to sort of relax watching, amazing as that may sound, in the, in the evening. So there was no news here, and I felt excluded. So instead of waiting for somebody to start it, I decided to start writing the news in English myself. And so I spent all week writing five or six very short articles, which I then sent out to, um, to people in my Svenska för invandra class, my Swedish for Immigrants class. And in the first week, I sent this as a newsletter to 12 of the people in my Swedish for Immigrants class. There were 20 in the class, but eight of them uh, refused to give me their email addresses. Um, but I was, I was quite happy with this 60% uh, this market share, and I, I thought I had some, something positive to build on. And so I started to look at this as a business, and I started to look at the industry and I started to see that this was really good time, a really good time to start a news business. The industry had been growing and growing and growing more or less since the 50s, 40s or 50s. And there had been a little dip around 2000, 2001, but things had sorted themselves up, out again. And I was convinced that, uh, that this was great timing. Now, <laughs> it turned out it wasn't. It turned out that it was a little bit harder than I was expecting it to be. And if you're going to understand our relationship with news, if you're going to be a conscious news consumer, as the title of this um, presentation it says, then you need to understand this. You need to understand that the last 15 years have been horrible for news. Even the most well-funded news companies, um, for most people working in those companies and for those companies themselves, the last 15 years have been a desperate struggle for survival. Everything that's changed in news in the last 15 or 20 years, everything we talk about, fake news, um, clickbait, the polarization and the sort of extremization of news can be traced back to this, this economic situation in the news industry, the way that the money has just flooded away from journalism. And that, that curve, that's the advertising revenue, that just carried on going up. But the money never came to journalism. It went to social media instead. So I want to talk to you about um, how you can think about the news you consume in the same way that you think about the food that you eat, the balance that you have in your diet, and how you can uh, find a more healthy way to consume news, healthy for yourself, but also healthier for our society and our democracy. And I want to show you a few examples of news that I hope will, will illustrate this. And, of course, there are thousands of news stories that you could be using, millions of news stories that we could be using. But I want to focus on a theme that I hope you'll find interesting and which has been particularly interesting to me over the last two or three years. And that theme is Sweden and the news outside of, outside of Sweden about the country. Now, it turned out that the local... Um, I wasn't the only person. The local is the name of the news company I started. I wasn't the only person, it turned out, who needed news in English. And to sort of jump forward 15 years from those 12 people back in 2004, the local now has 5.5 million readers each month in nine different country editions. So we publish Swedish news in English, France's news in English, Germany's news in English, and so on. And when you have that kind of reach around the world, when you're talking to that number of people every month, you end up getting a lot of questions. You end up getting a lot of emails from people who want to know more about the countries that they've moved to or the countries that they're planning to move to. And often these are quite boring administrative questions like, um, how do I uh, convert my American driver's license to a Swedish driver's license? Or I've just moved here, you know, how do I get a work permit? This kind of thing. Sometimes the questions are a bit more cultural 
philosophical questions like, um, like exactly how much is logom? You know, it's one of these sorts of questions that people, people have. And I was sitting in a, a cafe back in 2016, November 2016, and I got one of these questions. I got an email from a man in, in England who said, um, he said, Dear Paul, is it true that Sweden has banned Christmas lights? And I, I, I mean, I knew the answer to the question, obviously, but I looked out of the window, saw a whole street of Christmas lights, just to be sure, and I wrote back to him, and I said, no, it's not true. Uh, I can see a whole street of them. And he, he wrote straight back and said, well, thank you very much. I thought, this is strange. This guy's obviously, he's not trolling me. I mean, this, is, this was a genuine inquiry. And I started looking around. And it turned out that there was some truth in this story. It turned out that SVT and John Scherping had covered a story in which a certain number of, number of communer, uh, municipalities around Sweden had decided to no longer hang Christmas lights above the streets in their towns because these Christmas lights were getting um, bigger and more extravagant and there's more traffic going through these towns. So the local authorities obviously judged the risk um, that someone might end up being uh, crushed by Christmas and we all know how that feels. So they didn't do this. Now, this is not the kind of story that our journalists in Stockholm, um, who are covering Sweden, would, would write about. But that didn't stop a small site in the United States called Spacia from covering this story. The site doesn't exist anymore, but they did a faithful translation, a very accurate translation of the SVT story, right up until the last sentence. And that last sentence said, this change is a victory for those who want to tone down the reminder of Sweden's Christian traditions. Now, that wasn't in the SVT article, I can tell you, but that was the trigger that set off a chain reaction that led for, to this article spreading through social media, this idea that Sweden had banned Christmas lights. And it ended up on a site called Infowars, among many other sites. And Infowars became very well known around the time that, uh, that Donald Trump um, became president. As you, um, he, he, you may know, that he gave his first interview as president to, to, this, to this site, which is basically a, a right-wing conspiracy site. And Infowars ran this story. It then spread to certain blogs in the United Kingdom and spreading through social media. And looking at the number of times these articles have been shared about uh, Sweden banning Christmas lights, it's, it's fair to say that well over a million people will have been exposed to this, this apparently convincing story, but completely false idea, that Sweden has banned Christmas lights. Now, this story was the spark for a book I wrote called Good Sweden, Bad Sweden, and I was absolutely thrilled to see how many people work in libraries. You never get an opportunity as an author to sort of pitch a book to so many people working in libraries, so I take the opportunity now. Um, but I wrote this book, and it's not about an Englishman's view of what's good and what's bad about Sweden. It's a book about the two different stories that are being told about Sweden around the world. Now, the good Sweden story we can get through very quickly. Um, and Prince William from the United Kingdom was here last year, and he summed it up quite nicely. He was here to give a talk, a speech, and he said, he said that he had come here to discover the magic Swedish ingredients. He said, we wanted to find out what it, by we, he means him and his wife, of course, we wanted to find out what it was about Sweden that gave you such an enviable reputation in the world. Design, the creative industries, high-tech manufacturing, social justice, popular culture, the list could go on. And he's right, the list could go on, but not necessarily in the same direction. Because depending on which news sites you follow, depending on which um, commentators or politicians you're listening to, you could have a completely different idea of Sweden to Prince William. And I think this is, a, this is very illustrative of what's going on in the news industry today, this kind of polarization. So I want to go through some examples, and then we'll talk about why that's happening and then bring it back to news. So Breitbart is a, another news site that came to prominence around the time that Trump became uh, president. The chairman of Breitbart became the chairman of Trump's election campaign and then became a special advisor to him in the White House. And Breitbart runs this message of... of destruction and violence and, and collapse in Sweden consistently and has done so for many years. 
There are many different examples we can, we can use, but this, this story is kind of iconic, I think, and sums up many of those stories that, that you'll see on Breitbart. We'll come back to Breitbart in a minute. Um, but it's, when I started talking about this idea of these alternative messages about Sweden a few years ago, all of the examples I had were from the fringe sites. They were from um, you know, sort of extreme part of the news spectrum. Which, made it was, which meant it was easy for people to dismiss it and say, yeah, but that's at the extremes. You know, nobody really believes that stuff. But since then, this message has moved very much into the mainstream. It's moved to state TV stations like Rai in Italy, which this year did a documentary about these 60 no-go zones in Sweden. Um, and, and, and the Sharia law and, the, and the, um, the highest rape numbers and so on. These, these messages which have become part of the, um, the fringe story about Sweden, this alternative story about Sweden. And this report contains several misleading statements, but that didn't stop um, the Deputy Prime Minister of Italy at the time, Matteo Salvini, from, from using this news report. I mean, it's like using an SVT news report. Using this news report um, to push his own anti-immigration agenda. I don't think, you know, we don't need to translate that message. I think that's clear. And we've seen similar messaging from Hungary as well in t when it comes to state-sponsored messaging. But it's also, this, this, this message has also moved into the mainstream news, as uh, the mainstream media, as it's now become known. And this was in the, the Times, one of the most prestigious news brands in the world. And... It's important to be clear. I'm not saying that reporters shouldn't come here and report on the stuff they see and report on the bad stuff that's going on here. Of course, that's what they should do. At the local, we've reported more on the explosions and gang violence and, and uh, cr crime and so on in English in Sweden than anybody else. But what's super important is that when you're reporting on somewhere far away, and for most people, Sweden is far away, you must be very clear about the context. Context is everything. When you paint a picture of a country, you don't do it with broad brush strokes. You do it dot by dot, where each dot is one story among millions, combining to create a complex and nuanced image of that place. Because countries are complex and nuanced places. But when the context is removed, we see a very different story. And people react to this kind of story. They say, oh my God, this is happening in Sweden. How could this, how could this be in Sweden? If it could happen in Sweden, what could happen here? The, and an international journalist said to me, you know, this bad Sweden story, this is good business for journalism. It creates more clicks, creates more cash. The Express is a, is a site, uh, a newspaper in the UK, a very traditional newspaper in the UK. It's been around for over 100 years, which has also presented this constantly negative image of Sweden. They're mostly obsessed by Brexit at the moment, but this image of Sweden that they've put across in the last two or three years is a story of battlefield Sweden, Sweden in mayhem, Sweden at breaking point, lawless Sweden. And you, after a while, you look at this and you see these kinds of stories and you start to think, is this sincere? Is this real journalism? Or is it just propaganda? And the Express gives us a clue. It gives us a clue on their travel pages because a few weeks after this story appeared, in which Malmo was described as a no-go zone, a lawless city, I mean, literally, a place you don't go to, their travel journalist came to Malmo and had an absolutely lovely time. You know, she sat in, in Stortoriot and ate Kanel Bulla. Um, she thought everybody was so friendly and it was such a relaxed place. And we can kind of laugh at the hypocrisy of this. And, and you know, as a journalist, as someone working with news, you think, how can you have such an inconsistent editorial message? You know, don't the departments talk to each other? But the problem is the damage has already been done. So this balanced story that, written by a reporter who came to Malmo it has no effect because the comments under this story say things like, yeah, sure, let's all go to Malmo and get our daughters raped. Take pepper spray if you go to Sweden or you'll get robbed and raped. The news pages have already done the damage. There's also this idea that Sweden is home to some really sort of crazy thinking. This is also part of this bad Sweden message. And this was a story about Sweden that went everywhere in September. Um, it, was a, it started with an interview on TV4, on FDFM, and uh, a, a scientist, a, a professor of marketing, was interviewed. 
on this program. He was talking from the food conference in Gothenburg. And he was just talking about how food habits are changing and there's kind of different uh, taboos around eating different foods. And now that we have things like insects and burgers grown in labs, we need to think about what we find disgusting to eat. And of course, at the extreme of that spectrum of disgust is eating each other, which is not controversial. But the next day, a news site in, in the US called the Epoch Times had a story, Swedish researcher advocates eating human flesh. Um, Sputnik, the Russian state-sponsored um, uh, news platform in English, wrote, eat people to save the planet, says Swedish researcher. And then the following day, Breitbart had the same message. And of course, this was retweeted by, who do you think? Donald Trump, and it reaches millions and millions and millions of people, and it cements this idea that there's kind of crazy stuff going on in, in Sweden. Now, this is the second time I've referred to Breitbart, and it could have been a lot more. And I use it to illustrate the fact that a lot of these news organizations are obsessed with Sweden. This was one of the reasons I started looking into this. We have, as I said, we have these sites in many different countries, but we notice how Swedish news picked up and twisted and used in far more different news platforms than news from our other countries. And, and this is true. This, is, this shows the um, number of articles on Breitbart in September about different European countries. Right? And it's, I've adjusted it for population, so it's per million people. Obviously, bigger countries have more stuff happening, so there's more news. And if you look at this, I don't know if you can see that, but Greece and Hungary, there are more story, quite a lot more stories about Greece and Hungary, relatively, than any of these other countries. And that's interesting, because that shows the kind of immigration uh, focus of this site. Greece, obviously, being on the kind of front line of the immigration that's been coming in, and Hungary being one of the countries that has been most opposed to immigration in Europe. But look what happens when we add Sweden in. So relative to their population, there were five times as many articles about Sweden as there were about France, eight times as many as there were about Germany, and 15 times as many articles about Sweden as there were about Denmark. So what's going on? What's the context here? Should we just take this at face value that there's a lot of really bad stuff going on in Sweden, or should we think a bit about the context? Well, I think, as everybody here knows, there's a clash of values going on around the world. And on the one side, you have progressive values, values such as uh, tolerance, gender equality, feminism, openness, these kinds of things. These are values which the world associates with Sweden. Now, that's not the same as saying that everyone in Sweden has those values. But if you ask people around the world, you know, what, um, what do you think of when you think of Sweden? I mean, they'll say ABBA and IKEA and PewDiePie or something. But if you push a little harder, they start talking about these values. They start talking about gender equality and feminism and these kinds of things. So Sweden has become, in the last few decades, has become the flag bearer, farm bearer, for these values, for progressive values. And that's great when the world is moving in a progressive direction. When you have someone like Obama sitting in the White House saying, yeah, go and see what they do in Sweden, bring back solutions from Sweden. That's good news for Swedish trade and diplomacy and tourism and so on. But when the winds change, as they most certainly have, and there are strong forces against progressive values, where does that leave Sweden? Well, it leaves Sweden caught in the crossfire. Because as every soldier in ancient times knew, if you can bring down the flag bearer, come and fell the farm bearer, and you win half the battle. And that's what you can do here. If you are against these progressive values, you can show that Sweden is failing, and it shortcuts your argument. But you have a problem. The problem you have is that Sweden is not exactly failing. Yes, there are bad things that are happening here, just as there are bad things that are happening everywhere. Uh, but it's, this is not a failing state. This is not a collapsing state. In fact, there's an index, an American index, of failing states. It used to be called the Failing States Index, but I think that was a bit negative, so now they call it the Fragile States Index. And Consistently, Sweden is one of the 10 most stable countries. Ever since this index has been produced, it's always been one of the 10 most stable countries in the world. And you hear it all the time. Stockholm is the most dynamic region, best place for business, best place to be young, best place to be old. If it's not number one, then it's in the top 10. 
So if you want to claim that Sweden is failing, then you have to focus on those negative dots. You need to strip away the context and amplify that negative message, the scary stuff that happens. And that's easier to do about a country like Sweden, because people still don't know very much about this place. That's not Kebna Kaiser up there, as you know, that's Switzerland. You know, this Sweden-Switzerland thing, this is, this is real. People make this mistake. Sweden is still a very exotic, faraway country to most people. And, and, and here's proof. You know, when Spotify launched on the stock exchange in New York, as you may know, they put the Swiss flag up <laughs> instead of the Swedish flag. This does not happen to French or German companies. But this lack of knowledge, it makes it easier to spread disinformation about Sweden. You can push any message to people, and they have no context for, for assessing it, especially if it feeds their prejudices. Now, we get our news from hundreds of news websites, from thousands of uh, commentators, from millions of social media users. Today, we are all part of the news distribution system. That means we have a great responsibility. This, it's our psychology. It's not just editors in newsrooms who decide what we read anymore. It's our psychology. Bad stories get spread much faster than good stories. Stories which shock us spread faster. The stories which anger us, they spread fastest of all. So we have a great responsibility to share with care, but we don't. 60% of the news that's shared on Facebook hasn't been read. People look at the headline, they look at the picture, and they think, yep, I knew it, and they click, and that's it. They've shared it. It's gone out to hundreds more people. This, to me, is like sneezing on the bus without covering your mouth. This should be socially unacceptable. It should be socially unacceptable to share news that you haven't read. You know, journalists, we, when we're writing these stories, we, we really take this responsibility very seriously. We go out, you know, journalists who follow journalistic standards, you know, we go out, we get, we get quotes, we check those quotes, we get extra quotes just to be on the safe side, we check the context, we check our sources. You know, we put a lot of effort into checking that the stuff we're putting out there is correct. Because there's a risk to not doing that. There's a risk to our personal reputation, a risk to our professional reputation. And there's a financial risk to the companies that we work for. But for the rest of us, when we're members of the public and we're seeing stuff that we just share without thinking, I mean, the only risk is that you're going to hurt your finger hitting your keyboard so hard when you're angrily sharing this stuff. So this should be socially unacceptable. Especially since we now live in a world where seeing is no longer believing. I want to give you an example of fake news. Of course, there are hundreds of examples of fake news, but this is a personal example um, from, from Switzerland, not Sweden, but Huit Um This, back in Cornwall, uh, back in, I was in Cornwall on holiday in uh, 2017, and I got this message, quite a, a sort of anxious message from a journalist at Al Jazeera, and my colleagues had the same message. And she was saying, this story that you have on your Swiss edition, um, c can you tell me more about it? And she had sent a screenshot of this article. And the story said that um, FIFA, the w World Football Organization, was planning or considering taking the World Cup in 2022 away from Qatar because of Qatar being, uh, uh, of people saying that Qatar was sponsoring terrorism. Now, this was at a time when Qatar was being blockaded by the countries around it. Still is, I think, but people don't talk about it so much anymore. So it was an extremely tense time in the region. There were no flights going in and out. There were um, no food going in and out. It was a very tense time politically in, in, this, in this region. And of course, it was controversial enough that Qatar has the World Cup in 2022. And suddenly, we have an interview on the local with the president of FIFA saying, we might take away the World Cup from Qatar because of these allegations that Qatar sponsors terrorism. I mean, this is an enormous news story. And so we all started calling each other. We talked to our editor in Switzerland. And she said, I don't know about this story. And we think, well, what's happened? You know, have we been hacked? Or has, has one of our journalists gone rogue or, or what? And then our tech um, manager pointed out the website address of this article that the 
journalist had sent us. And instead of the local.ch, which is our Swiss um, website address, there was a little dot under the H of the local. Now, I didn't know that you could use these kinds of modified letters in website addresses, but it turns out that you can. And what had happened was someone had faked our entire site with all of our articles going back many, many years just to put this article in among them and then had started sending this article out. And we thought, OK, well, that's good. That's a relief. Now we know. you know. And we sent a message back to the, uh, the reporter at Al Jazeera. But by that time, it was too late, because by that time, and I'm talking about just an hour, this story had gone absolutely everywhere. It had gone all around the world through news um, agencies, through, through Google News, obviously. It was on big news sites in the America, sports sites. It was on the Sydney Morning Herald in the States, the Times of India, the Telegraph in the UK. It, was gone, it had gone everywhere. And once it's out there, you can't take it back. This story is still out there. So we need to be aware of this. And the thing is, the people who spread fake news, they have a lot of tools to use. They have factories, factories of content creators. They have artificial intelligence to create deep fake videos of people saying things they never said. They have bots to spread this stuff through the internet. They have celebrity commentators who are prepared to, you know, prepared to go along with whatever they need to say to raise their own profiles. But the most effective tool they have is us. Our anger, our psychology, these things which compel us to share stories. But the flip side to this is that we are also the best defense against this spread. We have the choice. In fact, our very democracy depends on our ability to override our emotions with rational thinking. So what can we do? Well, we can recognize that the truth is in the context, as I said before. The truth is in the context. The context of the content, but also the context of who is writing it and why. We can share with care. But there are a couple of other things I just want to leave you with as well. This is the problem. It's our brain. That's the problem. And our brains react to the information that we get. I mean, this is what brains do. You know, they react to the information that we get. Uh, this is a prehistoric newsroom I found a picture of react to the information we get. And for, for almost the entire history of our existence, 99% of the information that our brains have received has been local to us. It's been about the weather, or it's been about a tribe of people moving in, or it's been about wolves coming from over there. It's stuff that we can react to instantly. But today, 99% of the information that we receive is not local to us. It's interesting, and it's dramatic, and it's terrifying. But it's not directly, to our, directly relevant to our lives. It's out of our control. There's nothing we can do to meaningfully react to this. But paradoxically, we keep consuming more of this content, more of this distant content. You know, every day I read dozens of articles and snippets of, of news from all over the world, and my brain feels like it has to react to this. It has to behave in some way. It has to do something. But there's no way of doing anything. So I feel helpless. I feel out of control. And to create an illusion of control, I go and consume more of this stuff. You know, I must know more about Donald Trump's impeachment hearings. I must find out what these witnesses are all saying. It doesn't help. There's nothing I can do. It doesn't contribute to my life. And I think it, this stress and so on, the solution is to shift the balance of your news diet back towards more local news, towards the news that is more relevant to you, the news that affects your own daily life. And yet we've turned our back on local news. These yellow patches, these are the, the 35 communa or municipalities in Sweden where there is no editorial presence, no local journalism at all. And this is something which ha is happening all across the world. It's not just happening here in Sweden. The reason is because of the falling revenues into, into news. And what happens when there is no local news? Well, local politicians are not challenged. Gossip replaces reporting. People turn to national news instead, and by its very nature, national news is more general, less nuanced, and more polarizing, and in fact, there's evidence that shows that in places where local news has disappeared, people vote 
to the extremes. People's voting becomes more extreme and more polarised. So we need to turn back to local news. And of course, it all comes down to economics. It comes down to the economics of news. And there's something interesting going on. There's this shift now back to subscriptions, which is a very positive step for news. And the reason it's positive is that something interesting happens when you start charging for news again. People choose different stories. People have to are forced to make decisions about what they consume. And interestingly, what they consume is no longer this kind of fast, sugary, click, click, click news. What they consume are the longer articles, the deeper articles, more analysis, more thought, more healthy news, more nutritional news, you could say, to continue the food metaphor. So when you're thinking fast, you know, you go for that, that sugary stuff. But when you're forced to slow down, when you're forced to pay for news, you tend to consume that news differently. And that's very positive. And most people here probably already do pay for news because Scandinavia is ahead of the rest of the world in terms of these kinds of news subscriptions and different news models. But this is fundamental because this is what connects newsrooms back to their communities. You know, news is the glue of our communities and should be the glue of our communities. And this puts readers and, and newsrooms back together again without having advertisers or Google or Facebook there in the middle. So we round up. If you want a more healthy, less stressful news diet, if you want your news consumption to actually contribute positively to society and to democracy, there are a few things you can do. Remember that the truth is in the context. If there's no context, question the truth. For God's sake, think about what you share. Think about making sharing without, without checking it. That should be socially unacceptable. Try to introduce more local news into your diet. It's good for you, but it's good for your community. And finally, pay for news, because we all benefit in newsrooms and communities coming back together again. Become a conscious news consumer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. I have questions, Fire uh, but first I have a, a, an embarrassing anecdote. Uh, <laughs> I'm an immigrant in this country like you are. I'm from Finland. I, I lived in Denmark um, for a few years with my husband, who is Danish, and then we moved back across the strait to Malmö. And my grandmother, who I love dearly, but who is quite conservative uh, and lives in Finland, uh, said, Malmö, borde inte väldigt mycket såna där? And she's well raised, so she didn't quite know how to say this horrible thing that mm. she was thinking. She was, Borde inte väldigt mycket såna där invandrare där? And I looked at her and I said, Jo, mommy, det bor två stycken i vår lägenhet. Oh. <gasps> she was shocked! And it took her several seconds to figure out that I was referring to me and my husband, and she was so mad at me. But, but I felt that there was something like what I don't exactly know what image was in her mind from what I think is just mainstream Finnish news. But regardless, you yeah. know, I mean, she probably watches some, the equivalent of SVT and SR in Finland. And, and still she had this, mm. this image of this city where I live as a terribly um, dangerous place. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I find sometimes here in Stockholm, Stockholm even, that even Swedes uh, have, a, have an image of Malmö that is very, very different. So my first question to you is, how do you find the good Swede and bad Sweden narrative uh, reflected inside Swedish uh, self-image? I think the, the, the thing is, here in Sweden, I mean, you're right, it does exist here. And, and you know, you can't ignore the fact that there is a lot of news about crime. I mean, the last three months, 35% of the news on SVT, on, on, on TV, 35% was about crime. Now, this is probably quite consistent with most countries in the world, but it feels like a lot. So there is a lot of messaging coming to us about, about crime. So naturally, people think about this. But the difference is that here in Sweden, we can walk around and check what we see. I mean, we are living this daily existence here. People outside of Sweden who are getting this message, this is the only message they're getting. Mm -hmm. So it makes a, a greater impact. And in fact, you know, in the last two years, whenever I've have given these talks and talked about these, this alternative story about Sweden. Swedes come to me, 
talked to quite a few diplomats about this as well, and they say, you know, they get this message all the time, people coming to them saying, you know, I'm going to Sweden, is it going to be safe? Will I be safe in Stockholm? Um, and, and, you know, this is the result of people hearing news and, and so on without the context. Put it in the context, then it's, um, you know, it's, it's much clearer. I have a friend who's a very well-known journalist here in Sweden, I'm not going to say his name, but he had a, a call uh, by somebody, he's an expert in, in, um, in gang violence. And he had a call by an, a colleague from the New York Times who was going to visit Rosengård in Malmö, and, and he called him and said, oh, I'm going to Rosengård. Do I need to wear um, a bulletproof vest? And will I, need, uh, will I need a local fixer? And he's yeah. like, no, like, no, you can take the bus, like, no. And then this guy comes back from Rosengård, which by international standards is gorgeous, you know, mm. and there's all of this, all, and he says, you call this a ghetto? And he's like, well, no, you call this a ghetto. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not quite that. But again, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be complacent about crime. No. I mean, of course, there, there's stuff that needs to be dealt with here. But that's a separate issue from the propaganda and the disinformation. And the two things should be separated and thought about separately. This is my but, message. But it does seem to me that, that especially these far-right narratives uh, on sites like Infowars and, and Breitbart that are just like objectively evil mm -hmm. and out to spread disinformation in the world intentionally, that, that it seems like some of those narratives then become readopted by the far-right in Sweden and about uh, even just by extreme conservative parties. And that does seem dangerous, that this, this sort of loop of fake news yeah then comes back and actually affects yeah. how people, how com certain politicians are communicating in Sweden. Sweden, this idea of Sweden as a failed state, of course, we also hear from people who are in our parliament. Mm. And it affects how their voters view the world as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we used to call it, we call it the local, the boomerang effect, where you sort of, you throw a story outside of Sweden, a very small news story can go out of Sweden, it gets picked up by the New York Times, and then suddenly everyone in Sweden wants to write about it, just because it became a, a valgnihet. And... This happens with perfectly you know, normal and balanced news stories, but it also happens with this, where generally a small story, uh, maybe on a far-right website here, gets picked up by Breitbart, which then gets picked up by uh, maybe The Times or one of these other stories, and eventually finds its way back in. But it doesn't need to find its way back in, because Swedes consume more international news than ever before. And this is something which I think a lot of politicians have have forgotten. A lot of um, politicians have shown no interest at all in speaking to the international media and dealing with this subject, mm. except um, Sweden Democrats, which have, been, have put much, much more um, effort and emphasis on speaking to the international media. We can yeah. learn, perhaps learn from that. That, that is actually a super good point. And I, but on the other hand, we have, because of Jante, uh, we have this, this problem where if Swedish politicians from, let's call them perhaps more uh, established parties, serious parties, uh, would, uh, would speak to the international media, it's considered a little bit embarrassing. What, who are they trying to affect? Well, it depends what they're trying to say. I mean, <laughs> if they go out and start, you know, say, oh, Sweden's fantastic, there's nothing bad in Sweden. Well, yes, that's um, perhaps not the way things work these days. But, I mean, you know, I've... As I said, I've spoken to diplomats, and one of the um, diplomats from an embassy outside of Sweden said, oh, you know, whenever the local writes something positive about Sweden, we, we tweet it and we send it to everyone we know. And I said, well, maybe you should do that with the negative stuff we write about Sweden. And she said, you know, why, why would we do that? And I think the reason to do that is because if you don't, someone else will. You have to mm. own these stories. You have to own what's going on in your own country, not just the, the fluffy positive stuff. Yeah. Uh, I have some more concrete questions. One is, what were you able to do with that cloned version of the local? Well, not much, actually, because when we looked, to, we traced where um, this site had been set up. We, we looked through the, um, you know, the internet registration details and so on, and found that it had been set up. We found an address in Hawaii, which was where it had been mm -hmm. set up. So then we got into with people in Hawaii to check the address and it turned out that that address didn't exist. So there was nothing we could do about it after that. Just by putting um, our own messaging out there, you know, we kind of shine a light on the story and make sure that as many people as possible are aware of it. Um, that was pretty much the best we could do. But it's not just us. I mean, The Guardian has been copied in this way. Um, uh, uh, one of the big French sites has been copied in this way. I can't remember which one. Um, so this is not... This is not something unique to us, but it's a problem. And, and 
you, you know, we, we need to be really, really careful about it's what we check. It's also impractical that the crime that you can get them on, so to speak, is copyright infringement. Mm. And But I mean, and uh, you know, well, yeah, if you I were mean, Disney, if you're an, an, an organization with more muscles, you can get, you can suddenly speak to internet service providers and, yeah. and platforms about yeah. about taking that kind of thing down. But but for you guys, I don't think that's a realistic option. Well, no, I mean, I think the, the site itself did get taken down pretty mm. quickly, actually. And um, But no, I mean, we obviously don't have the resources to sort of go hunting on after mm. these people. Um, but, but, you know, their idea is not to, you know, start to create an alternative version of the local and keep filling it with stuff. Their idea to, was to get one story out, to get this single story out, push it out there, get it through um, the, the... I mean, tell you who should really be checking their um, processes is Reuters, mm. who covered this story and then spread it through Reuters their entire network. Reuters covered it? That is shameful. And um, thankfully, the reporter at Al Jazeera thought to to yeah. check it. Um, if the Reuters reporter had done that, then it wouldn't have spread half as far. Yeah. Uh, one of your slides had a little stamp on it that said, Colla po EU versus disinfo. What's yeah. that? EU versus disinfo is a European Union unit that has been set up to counter disinformation about countries in the European Union. Mm -hmm. it's, worth, it's worth looking at, actually, um, because they cover... Um, disinformation about many different countries in the EU, and they have long lists of stories, and a lot of those stories are about Sweden. So there's a lot of stuff about Greta Thunberg in there, for example, now. And they, what they do is they gather this stuff, they trace it, and then they write about um, you know, why this has been um, spread or who is spreading it. Um, and it's, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a very small unit in the EU, but it's part of their communications division. Uh, and my final question is, if whether you have any recommendations about about balancing the news diet. So a personal example is that I found I, I consume American politics and I have for many, many years, almost like a TV show. Mm. I realize I'm not a voter in that country. I, there's very little I can do, but I am passionately interested. And after the 2016 election, it just got out of control, like it took over my yeah. life. Uh, so I had to decide that I, I had to, I'm, I'm allowed to listen to the NPR politics podcast and I'm allowed to listen to, to the New York Times Daily and I am, I am a consumer, uh, a subscriber to the New York Times, but I don't get to read it every day, only sometimes. Uh, and that means that I will put no more than five hours a week on American politics, which is still a lot when <laughs> you think quite, about that it. That is quite a lot, actually. Uh, yeah. But then I thought, how much do I know about EU politics? And to be honest, nothing. And that is, you know, of course, mm. affects a great deal about, about how we live in, in Sweden. So I decided also, if I haven't listened to EU Podden, I'm not allowed to listen to NPR politics. And, and that was like a very practical way yeah. in which I said, am I being a good citizen yeah. in these things? Um, is, um, is my focus where it should be? And I realized that the, the news that I consume to be a citizen and to, be, to live and be present in my country mm. and in my part of the world is very different from the news that I consume for entertainment. And mm. sometimes we become a little bit confused about those, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. I mean, you, you know, you, you'll find, I'm sure, that the American politics is much more entertaining than the EU politics. Well, yes. I mean, it just is. But, but, but well, like I mean, say, actually, when you get to it, I mean, the characters are just characters. as vibration. There's, yeah, it's okay. fantastic in, in the EU yeah. as well. It's just that we don't know who they are. But once yeah. somebody explains to you what's happening in local politics in Austria or something, yeah. it's fascinating, yeah. you know. Yeah, but this is what we need to do, I think. I mean, we need to focus more on what's going on around us. Um, I think the mo one of the most alarming uh, slides up there is the one that showed the lack of local journalists in 35, yeah. um, in 35 communa in, in Sweden. You know, this, this is bad news. This starts to create vacuums in which all sorts of bad stuff can happen because it is the local journalists which, which hold power to account. Nobody else goes knocking on the doors. Nobody else shines a light on the bad stuff that's happening. Um, and I think, you, you know, you can bring it back to the EU, but I think we need to bring it back even closer to home, to what's around us. Yeah. I think that's really important. Um, and there's a very practical correlation about uh, political corruption. We like to think that we don't have political corruption in Sweden. That is nonsense. And the moment mm -hmm. the local journalists go away, uh, it goes up. Absolutely. So yeah. that's also a thing. That's yeah. also a thing we can do. We can put money in our local uh, journalism. But, but definitely. Well. Finance local journalism. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Do you have any final recommendation or final words that you want to say before I give you this chocolate? Oh, God, that's precious. Do I only get the chocolate if I say something <laughs> inspiring? You're going to get it anyway. Okay. Um, oh, I just... Um, I distracted him with the chocolate. Become a conscious news consumer. Become a conscious. Just give me the chocolate. Thank you, Paul <laughs> Rappicioli. Thank you very much.
Thank you.